Greetings. Father Mark Saturday I'm continuing the course on the history of Catholicism in the United States. Uh, we pick up now uh, with the, the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, not the first president to die in office, but the first president to die by assassination in office. He was assassinated on April 14th, 1865, two days after Mobile was captured, and five days after Lee, uh, Robert E. Lee, surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia. The assassination was the product of a conspiracy involving 12 people, led by John Wilkes Booth, lived from 1838 to 1865. He shot Lincoln at 10.15 p.m. in the Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. during a performance of Our American Cousin. Booth jumped to the stage, injured himself in the process, but did manage to escape to Virginia. Booth was born in Bel Air, Maryland, into a family of prominent actors, a trade which he pursued himself. He joined the Virginia Militia in 1859 and was a member of the unit commanded by Robert E. Lee that captured John Brown during the Harper's Ferry incident. Booth joined a conspiracy to assassinate prominent Union leaders after Lee's surrender. And that led to the murder of Lincoln. But Lincoln was not the only target. Simultaneously, Secretary of State William Seward, whom we've met already, uh, S-E-W-A-R-D, former governor of New York, was attacked in his home by fellow Booth conspirator Lewis Powell. Seward was stabbed five times, though he recovered. Lincoln, uh, after being shot, was brought to a lodging house across the street where he died the next morning at 7.30 a.m. The other conspirators did not carry out their assassination attempts, but were captured nonetheless. At 10.30 a.m. on April 15, 1865, Vice President Andrew Johnson took the oath of office as president. John Wilkes Booth was cornered in a tobacco barn in Bowling Green, Virginia, on April 26, 1865. He was offered the opportunity to surrender. He refused. So the soldiers surrounding the barn set it on fire, during which Booth died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound 12 days after he murdered Lincoln. Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, the final surrender of the state of Alabama took place on May 4th, 1865, at Citronelle, north of Mobile. The Jesuit College of Spring Hill was spared uh, destruction, uh, unlike the University of Alabama, which was incinerated by the Union troops. But uh, Spring Hill was used to house a garrison of federal troops during the occupation. The Confederate president, Jefferson Davis, was captured near Irwinville, Georgia, on May 10th, 1865. He was imprisoned for two years in Fort Monroe, Virginia. He was indicted for treason, and he welcomed the opportunity for a trial. 
as he always maintained that he, he was not a traitor, that if he, as at the time, he was a senator from Mississippi before the war, but he resigned the Senate and went and then went to Mississippi. Then Mississippi seceded from the from the Union. So he always, he said, his logic was that if, if he had done what he did while still a serving senator in the Union, then he would have been guilty of treason. But by resigning and going back to his state, then the state seceding, he said, you know, it was not, it was not treason because he, he was another country. Um, and he wanted to put that argument forward in court. And uh, the lawyers who were working on a case said, you know, there was no, because there really, there really isn't anything in the Constitution. Uh, there was nothing in the Constitution prohibiting secession. So one might, like Lincoln, you know, just, just might intuitively reject that concept, but there was nothing in writing in the Constitution to say that Davis was wrong. So uh, the trial never took place. Rather than... Uh, rather than take the risk, uh, uh, he was never put on trial. He died. Uh, he was. He did take the oath, uh, the amnesty oath, uh, and so he was released after two years. And he died in 1889, uh, right here in New Orleans, as a matter of fact, on a book tour. A warehouse on the port of Mobile, containing 200 tons of federal ammunition, exploded on May 25, 1865 reducing an eight-square-block radius to rubble, claiming the lives of 300 people. The windows of the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, 14 blocks away, were shattered. But the structure of the church held. Uh, the cause for the explosion was never officially announced. The Bishop of Mobile, Bishop Quinlan, suspected that it was deliberate, that, that it was some Union sol soldier set it off. Uh, yeah, who knows? On May 26, 1865, uh, General Kirby Smith ordered a subordinate, uh, he was a Confederate uh, general, ordered a subordinate officer to surrender the Confederate forces in northern Louisiana and Texas. Uh, he did not do it personally. And that was the final land army of the Confederacy to surrender. Nine captured suspects in the Booth conspiracy were found guilty of treason on June 30th, 1865. Four were executed by hanging on July 7th, 1865. One was a woman, Mary Surratt, S-U-R-R-A-T-T, -T, uh, the first female executed uh, in the United States by you know after a, a trial although it, it was a military tribunal it wasn't wasn't a civilian court but still um, along with Lewis Payne uh, at uh, P-A-I-N-E -E, David Herald H-E-R-O-L-D and George Atzerot A-T-Z-E-R-O- DT. Four others were imprisoned. Uh, Edmund Spangler, uh, Dr. Samuel Mudd, who was a doctor that set Booth's leg. Uh, Booth injured his leg when he jumped from the box where Lincoln was sitting down to the stage. And the Samuel Mudd didn't realize, I mean, he didn't know what, what had happened. He, you know, this Booth showed up, and so, but anyway, he he was thrown in jail, um, and another was acquitted. Uh, John Surratt was, was acquitted. The, the CSS, Confederate ship, uh, Shenandoah, was the final Confederate military unit to surrender. It was not a land unit, but still it was a military unit. 
It surrendered on November 6, 1865. They, uh, like Kirby Smith, they couldn't bring themselves to surrender directly to the Union. So they, uh, they sailed their ship to, to Liverpool, England, and, uh, and notified uh, the British consulate that they were, they were ceasing hostilities. And so then the British contacted the, the United States to notify the Union of the surrender. The Confederate captain Henry Wirtz, W-I-R-T-Z, was commandant of the military prison at Andersonville, Georgia. He was convicted of war crimes and executed by hanging on November 10, 1865. His crime was overseeing conditions so inhumane that 13,000 of the 32,000 prisoners died in captivity between February of 1864 and April of 1865, uh, most of disease. The human cost of the war uh, remains uh, nearly incomprehensible. Uh, uh, 623,000 and 26 dead, 471,427 wounded, and of those wounded are 50,000 amputees. Two of the questions left unresolved at the establishment of the Republic, which we covered in the beginning of the course, were finally answered. Open question number one was the relative authority of the state states as opposed or, or as distinct from the federal government. So that, that question was now answered. The authority of the state would henceforth be subordinate to that of the federal government. Open question number two was the propriety and the you know the the, the, the logic of slavery existing in a republic taking as its founding document the Declaration of Independence. Uh, that, that question was no longer open. Uh, after the Civil War, slavery uh, would no longer exist, uh, not, not legalized, legalized slavery would no longer, or slavery would no longer be legal in the republic. The conclusion of the Civil War in 1865 was followed by a 12-year military occupation of the former Confederate states by federal troops. American history books conventionally describe this period as Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, which uh, brings us occasion to become acquainted with President Number 17, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was born in Raleigh, North Carolina, 1808. Uh, though as a young adult, he moved to Tennessee, and that's where he made his career. He was a Jacksonian Democrat. He was elected to the state legislature in Tennessee, then to the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, then governor of Tennessee, then senator of Tennessee. And uh, he was senator... Uh, when the secession crisis commenced, he was, he was in the Senate. He was a Southern, obviously Tennessee, you know, was a, he was a Southerner, but, uh, but he was a Unionist. He, you know, he's one of those who believed that the, you know, the Union, it was better for the states to remain united. And he remained in the Senate as a loyalist, a Unionist, even after Tennessee seceded and joined the Confederacy. In 1862, Lincoln <clears throat> appointed him military governor of the conquered portions of Tennessee, uh, though he had no, no background as a soldier. In 1864, Lincoln selected him as running mate for Lincoln's second term in office. And as uh, vice president, he seceded Lincoln after Lincoln was murdered in April of uh, uh, 1865. Johnson's view of post-war policy was closer to Lincoln's than it was to the, uh, the neo-federalist radical Republicans, and they were not willing to accept this difference. 
as Johnson, like Lincoln, just wanted the Union back together. That was his priority. And punishing the South was not his priority. Whereas for the the neo-federalist Republicans, the radical Republicans, as they were called at the time, they were called that. Um, punishing the South was, you know, what was a priority for them, as well as uh, was um, uh, restructuring the society in the South to not only free the slaves, but to immediately, in that same generation. Uh, make them part of the society on all levels. You know, the, the civilian, uh, you know, all the, the, the trades, the professions, uh, as well as the, the governing structure. This difference uh, between the two, between, well, the two, between the executive branch at, by Johnson and the legislative branch, uh, which for a time was numerically dominated by the by the radical republicans triggered an adversarial dynamic that shaped the early years of reconstruction leaving reconstruction with fewer successes than failures the summer of 1865 was a congressional recess so lincoln was killed in april then the summer there was a recess uh, led by the reconstructor Republican representative from Pennsylvania, Thaddeus Stevens, the Congress could not muster enough votes to ratify Johnson's policy, which had been Lincoln's policy, uh, toward Louisiana, Tennessee, and North Carolina, because of, in their estimation it was too, uh, was too lenient. President Johnson retaliated during the congressional recess by recognizing, by just by executive authority, by recognizing the governments of those states after they fulfilled Lincoln's conditions. And he added Virginia when Virginia managed to do the same thing in that time period. And those conditions were uh, amnesty granted to anyone, even those who had fought under arms, uh, if amnesty granted to them, if they took the loyalty oath to the Union, and recognizing the state governments when 10% of the 1860 electorate um, 10% of the 1860 electorate um, took the amnesty oath and recognized the emancipation of slaves, and the end of slavery. Further, uh, Johnson appointed like-minded military governors for the remaining seven Confederate states, empowered to, first, convene conventions, uh, gatherings in those states, composed of those who took the amnesty oath, Second, that group would then amend the state constitutions of these former Confederate states to abolish slavery. Third, repudiate the state's war debt, the former the Confederate states' war debt, being the result of criminal enterprise and, and therefore having no legal legitimacy. The remaining former Confederate states followed this Johnson process with well, the Lincoln, you know, Lincoln Johnson process. The last being readmitted to the Union following this process was Texas on December 6th, 1866. Now, uh, but it started in, in 1865. Beginning with Mississippi, on November 24th, 1865, the readmitted former Confederate states began enacting uh, what were called uh, black codes in their state legislatures, in effect imposing feudalism on the freed slaves by means of contrived vagrancy laws and apprenticeship laws. 
so is they 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 ruined their chance. You see that so this they they had the Lincoln Johnson process. They were you know they were readmitted to the union under unbelievably lenient conditions, considering all that had happened. But then they start doing this, and uh, and that and so that gave the radical Republicans like Thaddeus Stevens ammunition to do what is about to happen. So one month later, December 13th, 1865, the Committee of 15 was formed, consisting of six senators and nine representatives, led by Representative Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania and Senator William P. Fessenden of Maine. The, these are, this is the beginning of the Reconstruction. Uh, their followers, their allies, uh, in the 39th Congress, then rejected President Andrew Johnson's authority uh, to implement his process, which he had done in the recess. You know, just recognizing those states by executive process and issuing a, a pardon to the Confederates uh, based on the, a simple amnesty oath. So the, so then they held hearings, congressional hearings. Okay, so that uh, congressional, uh, this committee summoned 144 witnesses assembling evidence of sabotage of civil rights for former slaves by former Confederates. This testimony was widely published and used by the Reconstructors to discredit President Johnson and his implementation of Lincoln's abbreviated lenient amnesty process. The same month, December 18, 1865, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution was passed abolishing slavery. Seven months after the surrender of the last Confederate army, May 26th, 1865, that was General Kirby Smith's army, northern Louisiana, eastern Texas. The 13th Amendment reads, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Note, remember we talked about this way at the beginning of the course, the dignity of the human person remains contingent on the definition of crime codified by a government that could be controlled by an organized political group that managed to get elected in order to control that government. So even even now, slavery is abolished. You know, it, but it, so it, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude. If it if it read that neither slavery nor involuntary involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States, then it would be absolute. But it's not. Because that's not how it reads. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, comma, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, comma, shall exist within these United States. So, slavery and involuntary servitude can still exist as a punishment for a crime, a person who's been convicted. Now, as we shall see, uh, this is going to be twisted because corrupt people can make laws. I mean, just because it's a law doesn't mean it's right. So, you know, a law can be made and written in any way so that a target group can be criminalized. And then the Constitution says, okay, okay, well, then slavery or involuntary servitude which means essentially slave labor in a, in, in a prison, can exist. So keep that in mind. The same month, that was December 18th, on December 24th, 1865, 
18 days after the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. Six former Confederate veterans met in Pulaski, Tennessee. They formed a paramilitary resistance movement to the northern occupation. They became essentially a vigilante uh, group employing terrorist tactics. The officers were all classically educated, and they had a high regard for the image of the free clans of the Scottish Highlands, which had resisted English tyranny through guerrilla warfare. They also had romantic notions of King Arthur's round table because they believed in equality for all, you know, obviously except slaves. So they combined the Greek word for circle. The Greek word for circle is kouklos. They combined that with the word clan, honoring the Scottish, you know, the Scottish clans of the Highlands, and, and became the Ku Klux Klan. They wore masks to conceal their identity as uh, they planned and carried out widespread violence from the beginning. They chose white for the color of their robes and masks because they, you know, they, they, they were fighting in the name of the ghosts of the fallen Confederate soldiers. The burning cross associated with their activities was another adoption from a romanticized notion of medieval Scotland. In the Highlands, the fiery cross was called the Krantara. It was a declaration of war against a foreign enemy, the English in their case, when primitive communication made any other means of instant notification impossible. The combination of clan, vigilante, violence, with the black codes of the former Confederate state legislatures, prolonged the period of Reconstruction over a decade after it officially ended with Johnson's readmittance of the former Confederate states. The following year, uh, July 16, 1866, the new Freedmen's Bureau Bill Past Congress. President Johnson vetoed the bill, but the bill passed over his veto, meaning they had a, a supermajority, over two thirds majority. This new Freedmen's Bureau was empowered to distribute land to former slaves and was empowered to adjudicate by military tribunal any instances violating the civil rights of former slaves. Officially, the military occupation should have ended when each state was accepted back in the Union. But the widespread violence enacted by the Klan and the necessity of coercion to implement the decisions of the Freedmen's Bureau continued the military occupation of the South. As um, that where is the land going to come from? You know, it, it's going to come from plantations uh, that, that were confiscated, such as Jefferson Davis's plantation in Mississippi. It was confiscated and carved up in, into plots. Well, not everybody's. I mean, Joe Davis was in a, you know, in a, in a, in a dungeon at the time, but you know, not everybody was. And so some were had to be evicted from their plantations and, you know, they wanted to fight. So, that we're not just going to give it up, so that's why uh, that one of the, the one of the reasons given for the uh, prolongation of the military occupation. Uh, April 9th, eighteen sixty six. Actually, I should have mentioned that I got the chronology bad, but uh, same year, eighteen sixty six. But a few a few months before, the Freedmen's Bureau was July, but this should have been first. April 9th, eighteen sixty six. The Civil Rights Act passed. Uh, once again, uh, Johnson vetoed it, but Congress passed it over his veto. It stipulated citizenship for all blacks and granted equal protection civil rights to all those born in the United States. 
uh, except Native Americans. It included the legal right to enter into contracts, to sue in court, to seek redress of grievances, to convey real estate, and to compose legally enforceable wills passing on property after death. June 14th, 1866. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution was formulated by the Committee of Fifteen to grant the highest possible legal protections of citizenship for former slaves, imposing federal protection of citizenship for blacks against any possible encroachment by state legislatures. Congress, the federal Congress, refused to seat senators or representatives from former Confederate states until after the state they were representing had been readmitted to the Union following the congressional process rather than the executive process of of Johnson's process, which had been Lincoln's process. Tennessee ratified the 14th Amendment on July 19th and then was restored to the Union through the congressional process on July 24th. The other southern states initially rejected the 14th Amendment, so they were denied seating in Congress. 1866 was an election year, uh, midterm election year. It returned a two-third majority in both houses of Congress, a supermajority in both houses, for the reconstructing Republicans, the radical Republicans, largely owing to fear generated by the the Klan vigilante actions, as well as some race riots. Uh, There was a notable race riot, for example, in New Orleans on July 30th with significant loss of life. The following year, March 30th, 1867, the Alaska Treaty was signed. The acquisition of the Alaska Territory, what eventually became the state, was negotiated by Secretary of State William Seward, who survived his assassination attempt. At the time, he was representing President Andrew Johnson. According to the terms of the treaty, the United States paid Russia $7.2 million, which amounted to two cents per acre, and acquired in return 586,000 square miles of new territory. October 7th through 21st, 1866, the Second Plenary Council of Baltimore was held, presided over by the host, the Archbishop of Baltimore, who was the Most Reverend Martin Spaulding, Uh, We met him earlier. He was Bishop of Louisville and then followed Francis Kendrick as Archbishop of Baltimore. He was appointed apostolic delegate by the Holy See for this uh, 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 plenary council. It was attended by seven archbishops, 39 bishops, two abbots, and even President Andrew Johnson attended the closing session. Uh, He obviously didn't participate. He He just attended uh, it produced 14, well, the, it, 14 decrees, but they in the, the documents, they call them titles, 14 uh, uh, titulae, the titles. Let's see, it won't cover all of them. Uh, title two deals with the hierarchy and the government of the church in the United States, stipulating uh, section three, that uh, the title two, section three that provincial councils should be held every three years. Title II, Section 5, the officials of the bishop uh, were to be uh, include diocesan consultors, a vicar general, vicars foreign, uh, or the rural deans, 
uh, Vicar Forianus, who were to preside over clerical conferences and to watch over ecclesiastical property. And they were to report annually to the bishop on the state of, of their districts. Other officials mentioned that should be in a diocesan curia or diocesan council are a secretary, a chancellor, a notary, a procurator for temporal affairs. Examiners and judges for canonical cases uh, should also be constituted. So that's uh, the tribunals, diocesan tribunals. And uh, it's also stipulated uh, each diocese was to have a court, its own court. That's the court of first instance, but there's also an appeal process. So there, there should be a, an identified court of second instance, an appeals court somewhere else, as uh, that was prescribed by the Council of Trent. Uh, title three concerning ecclesiastical persons uh, divided into seven chapters. Uh, chapter uh, chapter two bishops should make visitations of their parishes. Oh, no, skip that. Uh, uh, title seven, uh, no, title three. Chapter 7 uh, stipulated that uh, ecclesiastical seminaries are recommended in dioceses for theology and philosophy, uh, scripture, and Hebrew. No student was to pass from one seminary, seminary to another without testimonial letters. And it uh, mentions, this is a hint of what's to come with the uh, Americanism controversy later in the century. In those dioceses where Germans were there who could not speak English, it was expedient that the seminarians learn enough German to at least hear their confessions. Title four is on ecclesiastical property. Uh, just essentially just condemns trusteeism again. Uh, so we've covered that numerous times. I won't repeat all that. Uh, skipping down to Title IX on the education of youth. Teachers belonging to religious congregations should be employed whenever possible in Catholic schools. And uh, they, and you know, obviously... Uh, it's recommended that, that schools, parochial schools, be erected in each parish. But for children who attend public schools, catechism classes were to be instituted in the churches. And a desire was expressed, Title IX, Chapter 3, uh, to petition the Holy See to have a pontifical university, a Catholic university, in the United States. Uh, now, they already had Catholic colleges, Georgetown, Notre Dame, those were still colleges, but not a university. And neither one were pontifical yet, meaning they could not offer pontifical degrees uh, sanctioned by Rome. Uh, they were just offering civil degrees that are you know, recognized, like bachelor's, master's, doctorate, whereas the pontifical degrees uh, would, would start, would be the, the baccalaureate, uh, then the licentiate, uh, than the than the doctorate. Yeah. Title twelve uh, dealt with secret societies. Uh, now that you know, obviously, if they're secret, how can they be talked? Well, okay, so that that means when they, in the parlance of the nineteenth century, a secret society was one that had its members take their oaths in secret and commit themselves to things that were not publicized. So the existence of the groups were not secret, but the, but the, but the terms of their enlistment, individuals' enlistment in the groups were secret. Uh, so these were condemned for Catholics, meaning you know Catholics may not join. Uh, and those by name identified uh, Freemasons, 
the Odd Fellows, and the Sons of Temperance. And uh, uh, this, and uh, it's it's going this, though it didn't say it. It's going to be expanded later in the century to include labor unions, which at this period in the nineteenth century, remember the Communist Manifesto was eighteen forty eight. So by this point, it was assumed, you know, it was just taken as axiomatic that labor unions were were simply a front for communist infiltration in the country. And to be fair, many of them were, I mean, you know, not all of them and not every single member. But, you know, there were those who did have that agenda uh, in the 19th century as today and not just limited to labor unions. December of 1866, uh, the Supreme Court in ex parte Milligan ruled unconstitutional the resort to martial law in the southern states, where civil courts were in operation. But the Reconstructing Congress ignored this ruling. Uh, So they continued operating the military tribunals to enforce Reconstruction, even in those states that had been readmitted to the Union. March 1st, 1867, Nebraska was admitted as the 37th state. Uh, March 2nd, 1867, Howard University in Washington, D.C. was incorporated. Uh, General Oliver Otis Howard was a union officer and a co-founder of Howard University. And it was... uh, um, so it was created in, on uh, March 2nd and then uh, of 1867. And then later that year, on September 25th, uh, it was chartered by Congress. Um, is that normally states uh, charter corporations, and they, they would issue charters for, for universities, colleges, universities. But Washington, D.C. Is not, is not in a state. It's a federal city, so that's why Congress had to do it. That I'm mentioning this because uh, this is only two years after the Civil War ended, and Howard University was the f- chartered as the first all-black university in the country. March 2nd, 1867, was also, coincidentally, the first Reconstruction Act passed by the Federal Congress. There were four, four Four Reconstruction Acts. This was the first. Uh, once, uh, once again, President Johnson vetoed it, as he he was still trying. He was still adhering to Lincoln's more lenient philosophy: just heal the Union and, and move on with life. Uh, so he thought this would just prolong the bitterness and the hostility, and maybe even provoke another war. But the the Reconstructors had two thirds a majority in both houses, so they easily overrode his veto. So this first Reconstruction Act outlined the procedures for for readmitting the former Confederate states to the Union. Uh, and this just uh, all the conditions that I mentioned earlier formulated by the Committee of 15. With this, on March 2nd, that was all passed by Congress. This first Reconstruction Act divided the former Confederate states into five military districts. Uh, ignoring ex parte Milligan, so ignoring the Supreme Court. So, you know, the scream, oh, nobody's above the law. Well, you know, we'll see. Uh, each of the five military districts was placed under the command of a, of a general, a federal general, and the region was subject to martial law. States would be readmitted uh, one, at, one at a time after meeting the conditions uh, stipulated by the Committee of 15, now just written into law here. Uh, and they were refined from the from the first list. So condition number one, registration of all adult males to vote, meaning black and white adult males, in accord with the 13th Amendment, except those who had served in the Confederate Army or the Confederate government. And that was not a stipulation that Lincoln had, and therefore Johnson did not have. 
for them, anyone who took the took the loyalty oath could be restored. Condition number two, the election by these newly registered voters of state constitutional conventions. Third, drafting state con- new state constitutions at those conventions, granting writing into the into the constitutional law of each state full rights of citizenship to African Americans. Now, this was after the Thirteenth Amendment, but the Reconstructors did; it. they wanted it also written into state law, not only federal law. Fourth, the petition, the formal petition for readmission to the Union subject to approval by the federal Congress, which made the final decision by a vote to end military government or not. And if it did, the vote was to end it, then that state would be readmitted to the Union and its representatives and senators would be seated in Congress. So here, you know, we, we see the, the different lot, like Lincoln, as we saw back way to his first inaugural before the fighting even started, for him, it was ontologically impossible for a state to leave the Union. So he saw them as, as just rebel, rebels. You know, they were still in the Union, just, just rebels, and he was willing to forgive them if they took the loyalty oath. Whereas the Reconstructors did accept that the state seceded. They, they left the Union. So this process is treating them like, like territories, as if they were territories who were petitioning for admission to the Union, writing the Constitution and all of that. During this period, uh, re, the Reconstruction, the, during the occupation, African-American males entered the political process in the United States for the first time in, in history. Hundreds were elected to state legislatures in the former Confederate states. And they had a numerical majority in the state legislatures of five states. Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. Sixteen former slaves were elected to the federal Congress. And the public school movement was brought south during Reconstruction to provide literacy for former slaves. In the same month that the first Reconstruction Act passed, April of 1867, two years after its founding, the Circle Clan, the Ku Klux Klan, met at the Maxwell House Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee, and recruited former Confederate general, a native of Tennessee, Nathan Bedford Forrest to serve as the first Grand Wizard as uh, the beginning of creating a multi-state organization. <clears throat> now, uh, Forrest, I mean, I have to say, and you know, full disclosure, that uh, Forrest always publicly denied this. He denied his membership in the Klan. So his role in this is just based on anecdotes. This first iteration of the Klan was composed of unreconciled former Confederate soldiers uh, who had no life to return to. So they dedicated themselves to resisting the occupation process outlined uh, earlier that year, the Reconstruction process. They engaged in uh, systematic vigilante violence directed against blacks, uh, destroyed property of blacks, and of whites whom they felt were supporting the blacks. Uh, They burned schools uh, for blacks. They they burned churches where where blacks prayed, intimidated, uh, in some cases captured, kidnapped, and and tortured, and in some cases murdered, frankly, lynched. Uh, Teachers, you know, in in these schools. Uh, One local example, during the election year of 1868, in Louisiana alone, uh, the the Klan murdered 2,000 blacks and northern whites, uh, or at least, you know, pro-Reconstruction whites, attempting to register blacks to vote. In addition to this, the vigilante violence, 
the Klan uh, directed, uh, you know, uh, based on dermophobia, you know, a, a hatred of, of black skin. The Klan was also rabidly anti-Catholic. Many priests and nuns were assaulted in the same way, kidnapped and tortured, uh, and some of those were murdered. Catholic schools and churches uh, were, were also subject to incineration. Same year, 18, uh, well, no, the election was 1868, but so back in 1867. The second and the third Reconstruction Acts passed in 1867. The second on March 23rd, the third on July 19th. Responding to escalating violence by the Klan and race warfare. Uh, and the response was, was granting, uh, not only continuing the, the military, the occupation, but expanding the enforcement powers to the military districts governing the South to include the right of summary execution. I mean, execution without trial. March 11th of the next year, 1868, was the fourth and final Reconstruction Act, stipulating that only a majority of votes cast, rather than a majority of registered voters, was sufficient to enact the reconstructed state constitutions. Four months later, July 28, 1868, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, uh, which defined citizenship, equal protection under the law, and applied to the due process requirements of the Fifth Amendment, which was directed to the federal government, but applied those due process requirements to the states. And it set the voting age at 21. The amendment consisted of five sections. Uh, I won't read all of them. I'll read the, since, you know, obviously slavery is the, the salient issue here. Uh, I'll just read section one, which dealt with that. It read, reads, quote, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So, you know, the, this, the equal protection, remember that, so the um, equal protection clause, you know, that's one that'll, you know, loom large in, in 20th century debates. And, uh, you know, it's still with us. Um, note, the moral ambiguity present in the Declaration of Independence, paragraph 2, remains. Remember, we covered that earlier in the course. Quote, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. So the dignity of the human person, therefore, remains contingent on the will of a government controlled by elected political groups, interest groups. Uh, okay. 1868. The ongoing conflict between the Reconstructing Congress and President Andrew Johnson he kept vetoing all these laws, and they kept overriding them, so the tension continued, leading to the first impeachment of a president of the United States. The 39th Congress, 1866 to 68, enjoyed a two-thirds majority in both houses 
well, the recon- I should say that the reconstructing Republicans enjoyed a two-thirds majority in both houses during the 39th Congress, uh, and it uh, it exerted the reconstructing Republicans exerted this supermajority to neuter the executive branch as punishment to President Andrew Johnson for failing to support the reconstructors in their uh, more sweeping vision of reconstruction. So here's the sequence of events. July 23rd. No, what am I? July uh, July 22nd. July 22nd, 1866. Congress called itself into special session and voted to deprive the president of command of the military. The law that they passed, the Command of the Army Act, uh, were depriving (laughs) depriving the president, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, of command of the armed forces. The next day, July 23rd, 1866, they voted, uh, Congress voted to forbid President Johnson from appointing new justices to the Supreme Court. And next year, but still the same Congress, because, you know, it's two year uh, for the uh, term for the House. Uh, March 2nd, 1867, uh, was passed by a supermajority. The Tenure of Office Act, which deprived the president of the power to remove and replace officials appointed by Congress without Senate approval. So the Constitution says that that there are some offices, certain offices of state, uh, that the Senate must advise and consent. But this Tenure of Office Act expands that and says that He cannot remove, the president cannot remove a sitting official without the Senate's approval. Johnson challenged this, the Tenure of Office Act, on August 12th, 1867, by removing, without obtaining permission, removing the Secretary of War, Stanton, and replacing him with a Civil War hero, General Grant, Ulysses S. Grant the future president. February 24th, 1868, the House of Representatives uh, voted Articles of Impeachment. So that's the way the impeachment works. The House brings the charges, and then the the trial is heard in the Senate with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court acting as the the judge. And uh, the House... Uh, passed the Articles of Impeachment by a vote of 126 to to 47. There were 11 charges in the Articles of Impeachment, including violation of the Tenure of Office Act and violation of the Command of the Army Act and attempting, quote, to bring disgrace and ridicule upon Congress. The next month, March 30th, 1868, the trial before the Senate began, presided over by Salmon Chase, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and the Senate was the jury. On May 16th, 1868, the Senate voted uh, as follows. 35 for conviction versus 19 for acquittal. So uh, numerically more voted to convict, but that was short one vote as they needed two-thirds vote for conviction because that means removing a president from office. So they need more than a simple majority. So what did they, oh, it didn't end there. So then they, they voted again, voted a second time on May 26th, but the same result, one vote short. So then what did they do? Did it again. They voted again. Voted a third time with the same result. Always one vote short of the two-thirds necessary to remove Johnson from office. So Johnson remained the first president impeached but not recalled. From, that's what, you know, recalled from 
of that that's removing the president from office. So it's like he's recalled to the civilian state, you know. And, but uh, Johnson was, you know, was was ruined uh, politically. On November third, eighteen sixty eight, eighteen sixty eight was an election year. So November third, eighteen sixty eight, Grant Ulysses Grant was elected president. Twenty six out of thirty four states voted for him, and uh, the electoral vote was two hundred and fourteen for him, and eighty for others. The popular vote was three hundred and six. He won, excuse me, he won the popular vote by 306,000. Now, uh, what are the Catholics doing uh, during this period? The proto-diocese of the United States continued to exist when the original republic collapsed and existed into its new form uh, during the occupation, reconstruction, and afterward. As alluded to earlier, the Archbishop of Baltimore, Francis Kenrick, died during the war, 1864, and was followed as seventh Archbishop by a man from Kentucky, Martin John Spaulding, with family roots in Maryland. So, Spaulding, uh, born 1810, uh, died 1872. Uh, served as Louisville uh, Bishop of Louisville, Kentucky, for 14 years, from 1850 to 1864, and then Archbishop of Baltimore from 1864 until his death, uh, eight years later. He was born in Rolling Fork, Kentucky, the sixth of eight children of Richard and Henrietta Spaulding. His mother's maiden name was Hamilton. His ancestors were from England, although one great-grandmother was Irish. His ancestors settled in Maryland in the middle of the 17th century during the colonial period. His paternal grandfather, Benedict Spaulding, moved from Maryland to Kentucky in 1790. His mother's family had also been from Maryland, and her family had moved to Kentucky a year later. His parents married in 1801. Uh, Martin was a a cousin of Catherine Spaulding, who was a co-foundress of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, Kentucky. I think we mentioned them earlier in the course. When Martin was... uh, Uh, Six years old, his mother died, and he was placed in the care of his oldest sister and his paternal grandmother. His father remarried twice. Second wife died, then he married a third time, and had a total of 21 children with these three, three wives. Martin was sent to a country school. It's just a one-room schoolhouse. At the age of eight, received his first communion two years later. In 1821, he entered the newly established St. Mary's College in Lebanon, Kentucky, uh, where his uh, professor was a priest, uh, Father William Byrne. That's B-Y-R-N-E. He was uh, very good at math. Uh, so much so that uh, he he was entrusted with being a tutor in math to younger students. Graduated 1826, had already discerned a call to ecclesiastical life, so entered St. Thomas Seminary in Bardstown, Kentucky, in September of that year. He remained in Bardstown for four years, dividing his time between studying philosophy and theology, along with teaching, at the adjoining St. Joseph's College. So that's how he supported himself. Uh, In 1830, the bishop uh, of uh, Kentucky, uh, Benedict Flaget, F-L-A-G-E-T, we met him earlier in the course too, uh, sent him for major seminary to Rome. And as we saw earlier, 
the United States was considered missionary territory until 1907, and the seminary in Rome for students from missionary countries was the Pontifical uh, Urbaniana, the Urbanicum, the uh, Urban University, named for a pope, Urban VIII, who, who established it. Uh, he uh, fell seriously ill during the course of his studies, but he, he recovered his health, was an excellent student. 1834, he earned his doctorate. Uh, following a public defense of 256 propositions. So that's what they did at the time for pontifical degrees, uh, unlike uh, civil degrees. To get a pontifical doctorate, uh, that's what you did. You, you, it was a dialectic thing. So you, you publicly defended a series of propositions rather than write a dissertation, which is what you have to do now. Covered a wide range of topics uh, selected by his professors. Uh, theology, church history, canon law. He was ordained in Rome, ordained a priest in Rome by uh, on August 13th, 1834. Celebrated his first mass in St. Peter's Basilica in the in the subterranean chapel where where the uh, tomb of St. Peter's is located. Two days later, he caught ship to return home. Arrived in New York in October of that year. That made his way, you know, by river and road, back back home to Kentucky. On the way, he passed through Philadelphia, uh, where he met the bishop who was still Bishop Francis Kenrick at the time. Uh, now they already knew each other because uh, Kenrick had been a professor at St. Thomas Seminary, which was Martin's alma mater. So Kenrick allowed him to preach uh, in in Philadelphia, uh, which was turned out to be Martin's first Father Martin's first uh, first homily as a priest in the United States, and Martin would later follow this same guy Kenrick as Archbishop of Baltimore. Anyway, uh, Spalding Father Martin Spalding uh, made it back home to Kentucky in December. He was immediately appointed to serve in St. Joseph's Cathedral. Simultaneously with being professor of philosophy at his alma mater, St. Thomas Seminary. So seminarians, the tree of pain, see right away, newly ordained, have two jobs, at least two jobs already. In addition to these duties, oh, job number three. Uh, He was uh, appointed editor of uh, the Catholic newspaper, which was a weekly publication titled The Catholic Advocate. And uh, later, uh, he he founded another. Uh, the the advocate, you know, went out of, and he founded another newspaper, uh, titled the Louisville Guardian. In 1838, he did all these jobs well, so he received the customary punishment. Uh, he was appointed president of St. Joseph's College in 1838. Still had all those other jobs because you see, seminarians. That's that's how the tree of pain works. The branches entwine, and you hang from them. Uh, he was very unhappy in in his administrative duties, because of course that's part of the, you know that that's part of the of the punishment. You see, if he enjoyed administrative duties, then he would not be assigned those. Then he he would be assigned to do something else, because that also that's a characteristic of the tree of pain. Uh, he was appointed pastor of St. Peter's Church in Lexington, 1840. And uh, in eight, the following year, the see of Kentucky, so the, 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 the proto-diocese was Bardstown, Kentucky. That's where the see was, the cathedral was. In 1841, the see, Rome approved relocating the see of the diocese to Louisville. Because that's just the way the settlement patterns were. You know, people were settling, more people were settling there than Bardstown. So he was um, transferred to become rector of St. Joseph's Cathedral. Uh, he later succeeded. Uh, he later became vicar general of the Diocese of Louisville in 1844. And as Bishop Flaget uh, aged, and Bishop Flaget 
had a, a coadjutor who would have succeeded him, but that guy, Bishop Shebre, was was becoming blind. Uh, he had he had cataracts, and they you know there was no way to treat that, so you know knew he was gonna he was gonna go blind. So um, as vicar general, then Father Martin uh, had to assume more administrative duties. In addition to those he was actually assigned, he had to you know de facto take over more of them. In the course of his priestly ministry, uh, he also conducted uh, missions, parish missions, in the Diocese of Nashville, Tennessee, and he engaged in, in scholarship, published scholarship. In 1844, he wrote a, a book titled Sketches of the Early Catholic Missions in Kentucky, uh, which is which I used earlier. I mean, it's like, it's like the only source. And he, when he wrote that, he had access from the diocesan archive to some documents that have since disappeared. So you know, then. Uh, uh, and in 1847, he wrote uh, a different uh, work. This is an apologetics work titled "General Evidences of Catholicity." He built a reputation then as a you know a, a reliable administrator. Uh, a very engaging preacher and lecturer and scholar, which means more punishment is is on the way. On April 18th, 1848, uh, the, the punishment was delivered. He was appointed coadjutor bishop of Louisville, which means automatic designated successor. He was ordained a bishop on September 10th uh, from Bishop Flaget, whom he would later succeed in Louisville. Also present was Bishop Kendrick, whom he would later follow in Baltimore, and a guy we've already met, the Dominican, uh, Richard Miles, the Bishop of Nashville. Uh, Bishop Francis Kendrick's brother, Archbishop Peter Kendrick of St. Louis, Missouri, preached the homily on the occasion of Spalding's ordination as bishop. Spalding selected as his motto, uh, Auspice Maria, uh, under the protection of Mary. When Bishop Flaget died on February 11th, 1850, Spalding automatically succeeded as Bishop of Louisville. At the time, the diocese comprised the entire state of Kentucky, including over 30,000 Catholics, served by 40 churches, 10 chapels, excuse me, 43 churches, 10 chapels, and 40 priests. One of his first acts as a sole bishop, as an ordinary bishop, was to visit all of those, uh, uh, all of those institutions, as well as uh, convents in the, in the diocese. He... Uh, Completed construction of the Cathedral of the Assumption in Louisville. You know, because the, the sea, when the sea was moved from Pottstown to Louisville, they needed a, you know, cathedral. So his predecessor, Bishop Flaget, started it and uh, he finished it, the Cathedral of the Assumption. This new cathedral was dedicated by Archbishop John Purcell of Cincinnati, whom we've encountered numerous times, in October of 1852. That same year, now, Bishop Spalding attended the first plenary council of Baltimore, which we covered. The council successfully petitioned uh, the Holy See to divide the Diocese of Louisville, hiving off territory to create a separate diocese of Covington, Kentucky, uh, which Rome did in 1853. And that uh, initially comprised uh, the part of the state east of of the Kentucky River. In order to address the shortage of clergy in his diocese, Spalding traveled to Europe for a year to recruit and to raise money. He recruited the services of a number of priests as well as the Zaverian brothers to uh, teach in, in schools. During his visit to Belgium, he conceived the idea of establishing an American college at Louvain, Belgium. Louvain was a historic medieval university that was still there. 
but he wanted to establish a college within the university for American students, uh, which he did. He brought the raise money, you know, persuaded people to do it, and it opened in 1857. In August of 1855, uh, Spalding faced an anti-Catholic riot known as Bloody Monday in Louisville, uh, which we covered in great detail earlier in, in the uh, course. Uh, he played a, a leading role at three provincial councils of Cincinnati. His diocese was within the metropolitan province of Cincinnati in 1855, 58, and 61. He was also uh, a consistent advocate for a Catholic parochial school system. He denounced public schools, the public school movement, uh, as godless and, and, and spoke strongly against uh, Catholics who would send their children there. At the beginning of the American Civil War, Spalding ordered all churches in the diocese to pray for peace. Uh, he sought and he counseled his clergy to avoid, quote, angry political discussions. Uh, now, he, as we saw earlier, he, he published things, though, uh, in, in even some things in Europe that demonstrated his sympathy for the Confederacy in terms of the state's rights issue, as well as his fear of immediate emancipation. Uh also, during the, uh, during the war in 1861, he closed St. Joseph's College and made its facilities available uh, for a hospital for, uh, for soldiers, and it remained a hospital for the rest of the war. By the end of his term in Louisville, the diocese had grown to 70,000 Catholics, 85 churches, and he also published... Uh, three more books as in, in his well not spare time he just you know just did it imposing more punishment on himself uh, he wrote a biography of uh, of his one time bishop and mentor uh, Bishop uh, Flaget it's titled uh, Sketches Sketches of the Life Times and Character of the Right Reverend Benedict Joseph Flaget he also published a two-volume history of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but it was more, even though he calls it a history, it's more of an apologetics work. And he titled another, uh, published another book uh, called uh, uh, Miscellany, Miscellanies. It's just, it's an anthology of essays on, on various topics. Uh, following uh, another of his former teachers, is you know, uh, Bishop Kenrick, Francis Kenrick, uh, been in Philadelphia, then 1851, was transferred to Baltimore. And following his death, Spalding became seventh archbishop. He was installed in the Cathedral of the Assumption in Baltimore on July 31st, 1864. He uh, conducted a visitation of his diocese, uh, confirmed 8,000 people. He established uh, additional parishes and, uh, and invited more religious orders to the Archdiocese of Baltimore. I mean, not all of them accepted, but, but uh, some did. One of the institutions he founded was called St. Mary's Industrial School. Uh, that was, uh, it was a success, and uh, it, 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 was, it was a success that would be imitated in other places, uh, and, and even down here. So those of you locals uh, may remember Hope Haven, uh, which you know was one like this. So it's called an industrial school. Okay, so what it, that that it doesn't mean what you probably think it means. So it was a combination of things. It would it was essentially an orphanage, and in this case, it was for boys uh, who you know who lost their lost their parents. So the boys would they'd live there. That would be their home. Uh, but they also had to be taught, so it was also a school. But then to support themselves, they they it would be on a farm, and the boys would do the work, you know, under the guidance of the brothers or who, you know whoever was in charge. So they would learn skills, 
you know, they'd rotate through each, each age group would be in charge of something. So as you grew, you did more and more stuff, you know, one age group would feed the chickens, you know, and, and, and collect the eggs. Another would, you know, milk the cows, um, you know, another would, would, you know, shovel out the, um, the barn, you know, clean up the barn. And, uh, these industrial schools also had, would sometimes specialize in things that they could sell. Some of the, you know, they could sell food, they could make bread, you know, they could do, but some also did other things like Hope Haven in New Orleans, uh, on the West, in the Archdiocese of New Orleans on the West Bank. They uh, published books. They it was a printer. You know, it was an, uh, and so the, then the boys would learn all this stuff and, and in some cases also learn a trade. So when they aged out, they had something, you know, some skill to put on the market. Anyway, this was a pioneer model and it worked. So, and it would characterize uh, one form of church ministry for the rest of the 19th century and into the 20th. It was really after World War II that they started. Though those things disappeared, you know, as, as the government expanded and took over more and more of those things. Uh, okay. A great deal of Spalding's time in Baltimore was wasted or was, you know, occupied in dealing with politicians. So one difference, one thing you have to understand that's different from now is the Archdiocese of Baltimore at this period cut, included the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. So even though Baltimore was not the capital, the Archbishop of Baltimore was the Archbishop of the capital. Now, later in history, in 1939, the Archdiocese of Washington was carved out and made its own archdiocese, which it is now. There is now an archdiocese, an archbishop of Washington, D.C. But at this point, it wasn't. So Spalding was the prelate. He was the, you know, this the ranking prelate of the nation's capital. So he had to deal with these people. Um, and he was regularly asked to intercede with government officials when difficulties connected with church personnel or property arose. So, for example... Retired Bishop Michael O'Connor was a friend of Secretary Stanton, Secretary of War Stanton, and helped, and, and so through that vector, Spalding managed to help, managed to uh, uh, get Bishop Elder, William Henry Elder, uh, Bishop of Natchez, Mississippi, released from, from prison as he was arrested by General the Union General Benjamin Butler. Uh, during the occupation because he refused to take uh, the oath, the loyalty oath. Um, the inspector general of the army was a guy named James Hardy. That's H-A-R-D-I-E. He was a Catholic. And uh, he gave the archbishop regular assistance, which was not always an easy task. One example, when uh, federal troops uh, ran... Uh, dug defensive works around Savannah, they dug through a Catholic cemetery. Bishop Vero protested so vociferously <coughs> that he was arrested. And the, the bishop, I mean the uh, general uh, down there, uh, Quincy Gilmore, <coughs> Was, was thinking about yeah, actually executing this, you know, the bishop for treason. He, he probably wouldn't have done it, but he was just mad because Bishop Vero, you know, got in his face and screamed at him in front of the general's men. So, you know, that was foolish of the bishop, but he did it. And so it was left to Spalding to get him, you know, get, get, this, get this bishop out of jail. Uh, 1865, starting with that, with the end of the war, Spalding had to act as a go-between and a litany of these things. As uh, even under the, the, the lenient Lincoln-Johnson process, many of the former Confederates would not take the loyalty oath and so therefore were not eligible for the amnesty. Uh, and this would include some churchmen or friends of churchmen who wanted help getting him out. Uh, on April 14th, Lincoln was shot and uh, Spalding issued a statement reading, quote, a deed of blood has been perpetrated 
which has caused every heart to shudder, and which calls for the execration of every citizen. Problem for the church in all of this, the conspirators, the Booth conspiracy, met in a boarding house. It was like a hotel, uh, but it was a home. You know, like we could say a and b today. Uh, it was owned by Mary Surratt. She was a Catholic. Now, she was probably innocent. You know, she probably was not involved in the conspiracy. But nevertheless, she was arrested, convicted, and hanged. The first woman executed as part of a judicial process in the United States. Uh, and another innocent victim was a Catholic physician, Dr. Samuel Mudd, uh, the guy who uh, set Booth's leg, injured leg, without realizing that Booth had murdered the president. Nevertheless, he was arrested. And uh, he was kept in chains uh, in, a, in the, that generation's version of Guantanamo. He was kept in Fort Jefferson on the, in the dry Tortugas. Uh, Bishop Spalding presided over the first general meeting of bishops since 1852. This was the second plenary council in Baltimore, uh, which met for two weeks, beginning on October 4th, 1866, and finished with a solemn session attended by President Andrew Johnson. Uh, spectators lined the streets, um, uh, 45 uh, prelates, bishops, and archbishops and bishops, two abbots walked in procession, accompanied by a phalanx of their, you know, Paridi, theological advisors, hangers on. Uh, they had an orchestra, uh, which played the the march from Tannhauser. They did uh, most one of Mozart's masses. I think it was his twelfth mass. The bishops at that point in 1866 represented a church of uh, the Catholic Church consisted of four million members out of a national population of 30 million. Since the previous plenary council in 1852, only 14 years earlier, the number of churches and priests in the country had doubled. The major reason for this increase was evidenced by the council fathers themselves. Of the 47 mitered participants, 30 were foreign-born immigrants. As uh, in previous councils, uh, uh, provincial and plenary, uh, the bishops agreed, you know, on a series of, you know, practical decrees how to govern the church in this. This canon law wasn't written with it, you know, with, with the United States in mind. You know, it, it, this idea of a secular republic. Produced 534 pages of canonical legislation and a series of statements on theological topics. Uh, all right. I'll skip that. All right, yeah, we covered all this. Yep. All right. Following the end of the Civil War, Spalding made a number of appeals for financial aid to the defeated South. Uh, in response, the Catholics of Baltimore donated $10,000 to relief efforts in the South. And $10,000 in 1865 was, that was a lot of money especially people living in an economy that, you know, after four years of war. Uh, in 1867, Spalding visited Rome to participate in the uh, First Vatican Council. No, excuse me. It, to participate in the, uh, in the 500th, no, was <laughs> the 1800th, anniversary of the martyrdom of St. Peter. So 67 AD to 1867. Uh, he returned to Rome two years later to attend the First Vatican Council, 
where he was a member of the Commission on uh, Faith. Uh, and we'll we'll cover that. Uh, we'll get that to the ne- that in the next decade, as it started in 1869, but went into 1870. Uh, Spalding had, was afflicted with poor health, especially toward the end of his life. A short time before Christmas, 1871, he went to New York for a meeting. On his return home, either there or on his return home, he got sick. Uh, and it, it, it settled into his lungs, became bronchitis, and he died of that a month later at the age of 61. He was buried in the crypt of his cathedral of the Assumption in Baltimore. Uh, so next we move into the decade of the 1870s, where we will go into more detail on President Number 18, although we've already met him as a general, Ulysses Grant, uh, and we'll uh, cover the eight, you know move into the a decade of the 1870s. So for now, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.